People who are new, they're not clapping for me, in case you're wondering. Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you that we can be here together. Lord, thank you that you're with us. Lord, thank you that you don't leave us to our own devices, Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us, but you are in our midst. Lord, you're here this morning to teach us your word, uh, to prepare our hearts for the ministry that we face in this life. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. Lord, I pray that you would empower me by your spirit to speak your word with boldness, uh, Lord, with authority, with power, with all the authority of heaven. Uh, Father, I pray that you would just allow me to get out of your way, uh, that you would have your way with us here this morning. Lord, that you would speak to us through your text, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, I hear that it is Amber Collins' birthday today, so... If you don't know Amber, make sure you say happy birthday to her before you leave and get a chance to meet her. Corey, let me know to make sure everybody knows it's Amber's birthday. (laughs) Guys, before you leave today, there is a petition in the back uh, on the welcome table. Please sign that. It is a petition to make uh, our county, Citrus County, a uh, sanctuary for the unborn. And so with Roe versus Wade uh, looking like maybe it will be repealed, we're... Looking forward to this amazing victory, uh, but that's not the end of it. That's not the end of our, the war. The war against the unborn is still waging, and so our job is to uh, shout praise over what's going to happen, but also to take initiative and see what the Lord is doing. And so if you would sign that petition in the back on your way out, if you feel so led by the Lord to do that, that would be wonderful, okay? Um, Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand. It's important that you have one. You need one. We're going to study the Bible this morning. Something different than what we normally do, right? (laughs) Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And so in chapter 7, verse 1, we'll just jump right in. Chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. Chapter 7, verse 1, the first word, now. So you have this transitional phrase, right? You have this transitional word that's happening, working from the first six chapters into chapter 7. Paul is kind of switching gears here. I don't like to say that he's changing subjects because he's not. He's not changing subjects at all. The subject remains the same. The context of what he's been writing is very important up until this point. Remember, Paul has been correcting problems within the church in Corinth, working into chapter 7. Paul first discusses their division that's happening within the church, a division that's happening as a result of wrong thinking. They have, uh, they're dividing over teachers, right? They're dividing over silly things. Forgetting who they are in Christ. Forgetting what Jesus has done for them. Forgetting the unity that they have in Him. That they were once in darkness, have been brought to light. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with having a preference. There there is nothing wrong with having someone in the church at Corinth saying, I prefer the way the Apostle Paul teaches. There's just something about the way the Holy Spirit uses him for me that touches my heart and, and washes over me. The Holy Spirit just uses him in a special way for me. There's nothing wrong with that. But what was happening is that they were dividing. There was, there was uh, schisms happening within the church. They're dividing over teachers. I'm of Paul. I am of Apollos. They're dividing fellowship over silly things. And Paul would remind them of who they are. Paul would remind them of how stupid that is and tell them to be in unity, that they should be in unity. And then Paul starts to deal with sexual immorality within the church, that there's this immorality happening within the church that is public knowledge. They know about it, they see it, and they're tolerating it. Not only that, but they're glorying in their tolerance over it. That there's a man within the church who is sleeping with his stepmother. He has an ongoing relationship with his stepmom. And so Paul is saying, look, this is immorality that's not even known among the Gentiles. And Paul gives the prescription for that. He says, put him out of the church. And so, we talked about that in detail. We talked about that in depth. Why is it that Paul would say to deliver this man's flesh to Satan, that his soul might be saved, that his spirit might be saved? 
The point isn't that Paul is unloving to the man. The point isn't that Paul doesn't want the guy around. The point that Paul is trying to make is, look, we need to put him out of the fellowship. We need to put him out of the umbrella of God's covering, delivering his flesh to Satan so that the world would deal with his flesh and he would desire fellowship and repent of his sin. Always church discipline, always the discipline from the Lord is with the hope of reconciliation. Always. We see that over and over and over again in Scripture. We see that in the way that the Lord deals with the nation of Israel, even though the nation of Israel is immoral, even though the nation of Israel is committing spiritual adultery against the God who rescued them over and over again, and the Lord has to bring judgment upon them. And for their immorality of sacrificing their children, the worship of false gods, always the heart is reconciliation. The heart is that they would come back, that they would turn to him whom they have pierced. The heart is that they would cry out for the Lord and he'll be there. And that's exactly what Paul is getting at with this man. Look, deliver his flesh to Satan. Let the world deal with his flesh. Let Satan consume his flesh so that he would cry out for Jesus. And we see that in 2 Corinthians. It's my, it's my opinion that that's what Paul is getting at in 2 Corinthians, that this man has repented. Now bring him back into fellowship. It's a beautiful thing, right? The point of church discipline is not so that we can just get a problem person out of our congregation. Well, hopefully not. If that is, then we need to deal with our own hearts in that. But the heart of church discipline is reconciliation. Always. Always. Paul is dealing with them in their division. He's dealing with them in their uh, celebration of sexual immorality. And he's dealing with them about civil matters within the church. That they're bringing each other to court. And Paul is reminding them, not only should you have unity in Christ, there shouldn't be silly divisions. Not only should you not be tolerating immorality within the church and open, flagrant, sinful behavior, but also we are a witness for the Lord to the world of unity and love. So if we're bringing each other to court, how are we looking like Jesus? He said it's better that you should just accept the wrong. It's better that you should just let yourself be cheated than to bring your brother into open court, especially before unbelievers. But he doesn't say that there should be no solving of the problem. He says, deal with it amongst yourself. Deal with it. Take it to the elders. Take it to the church and and let them deal with it. There should be at least one among you who's wise enough to deal with these matters. Don't you know that you'll judge angels? How much more should you be able to judge the small things of the world, right? Paul is reminding them of who they are. And then Paul is dealing with uh, what they perceive as their liberty, right? Paul deals with the philosophical problem of liberty within the church. And he quotes this. He says that food's for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, Paul is dealing with this ideology within the church at Corinth, really within the church at large. We see this ideology within the church here, now, today, in our culture. We talked about this last week. In our culture, it's not only looked at, it's not only, it's not only accepted, but it's celebrated that you should be with your partner before you're married. That there should be sexual relation going on between you and your partner before you're married. Not only that, you should, you should shop around. Make sure... You get what you want in your marriage. And Paul is dealing with that. Look, yes, the the belly may be for food, but your body is not for immorality. That's not what it was made for. Your body was created for God. It is his. It's created to be the temple of the Most High God. And the word that he uses there for temple is a special word only used for the Holy of Holies. Paul dealt with this already back in, earlier on in this letter that the church at large is the temple of God. That the church at large is the holy of holies. This is where the very presence of God dwells within the church today. But then he brings it to the actual individual and says, not only is the church at large the holy of holies, but you yourself are the dwelling place of God in the spirit. That's amazing. Guys, that is amazing. Not only are we being built together as a holy dwelling place for God in the Spirit, but you individually have been called and washed, sanctified by the Lord, called holy before Him so that the very presence of God can dwell in you. Amazing. That's amazing. That no one needs to go any further than meeting a believer in Jesus to know what God looks like. Because He lives within you. People don't need to wonder. You are the holy of holies on earth. 
Paul in verse 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a pri- at a price. Therefore, in light of that, in light of the fact that you are the purchased possession of Jesus, that he has bought you with his blood, in light of that reality, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now... Concerning the things of which you wrote to me. Now, Paul has laid this groundwork and he's dealt with them about the concerns that he has for the church in Corinth. And what I love about this first verse in chapter 7 is we see a little bit of the relationship between Paul and the church in Corinth. Now, we know that Paul loves this church. The only other church where he spends more time than Corinth is Ephesus. He spends a year and a half there in Corinth, discipling, directing the church, uh, evangelizing the people there in Corinth. He spends a year and a half there. And then even after he leaves and continues on in his missionary journey, he's in Ephesus, and he receives a letter from the church in Corinth about specific practical things within the church. I love this. This is awesome. This is really giving us a glimpse of the pastoral heart of the Apostle Paul for the church in Corinth. And I don't think it's it's just restricted to the church in Corinth. I think... The Apostle Paul has a pastoral heart for all of the churches. Uh, We can see that in Romans, right? As Paul writes this letter to Rome, as he writes this letter to the church in Rome, a a church that he hadn't even visited yet, we see his heart to the church. And here, Paul is writing for correction to the church in Corinth. And sometimes that's a difficult thing for us to receive rebuke and correction. But when someone corrects us, it's because they love us. And so we see... Paul's heart of love for the church. And we see the heart of the church towards the Apostle Paul. How highly they regard him. Now we know that there were some there that were not holding him in the right light. That were thinking less of him than they should. And there were some there that were thinking more of him than they should. But ultimately they respect him as a Bible teacher, as an apostle, and as a pastor. They're writing to him and saying... Look, we need some practical application here. We need some instruction. We need to understand how to deal with specific things within the church. And that's the right model for us. If you don't know what to do, ask. If you don't know how to handle a situation, ask. There's wisdom that the Lord has given specific people, people who have been walking with him for some time, who have seen situations like this. There are, there are things that you're facing in your life that maybe you feel like nobody would understand. But if you were to just ask, I think you'd be surprised how many people could give you wisdom in that. Wisdom that they've received first and foremost from the Lord. And so they're writing the Apostle Paul, what do we do? It says, now, concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's a, difficult, that's a difficult place to start. Listen to what he's saying. Uh, remember the, the context of who he's writing to. Remember what's going on in Corinth. Remember the culture of that city. What these people have been saved out of. There's over a thousand temple prostitutes at any given time there in Corinth. That the culture is steeped in immorality. That it's an act of worship to go to one of these uh, temples and to sleep with a temple prostitute. That's what they were saved from. That's the pagan ideology that they came out of. And we see the way that that ideology is even affecting the church in Corinth. That they're allowing immorality to become rampant in the church. And Paul would say, look, concerning the things you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. No doubt that's ruffling feathers there in Corinth. No doubt that's difficult for us to hear even now. Can you imagine a new believer coming into the church... And this being the first message that they hear from the Apostle Paul. Hey, it's good not to touch a woman. Well, then I want nothing to do with this religion. I'm out of here. Paul's going to qualify. He says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. And so it would appear that there is some differences in opinion happening within the church at Corinth. Now we see on one hand they're celebrating or even glorying in their tolerance of immorality within the church. But there's also a a stoic ideology that's happening within Corinth at this time where they're thinking that All sexual conduct is evil because it satisfies your carnal desire. And if it satisfies your carnal desire, then it must be evil. 
And so there's this butting of heads happening within the church, and they're wondering, Paul, what's the reality of this? How do we navigate this as believers now? Should we be so set apart, so set above the system of the world that we shouldn't even consider these things? Or are they God-given desires? What do we do here? And so Paul says, well, listen, it is good if you, for a man not to touch a woman. He's going to go into this, that if you feel so called to not have a wife, if you don't have a desire to be with a woman, that's fine. It is good. Paul would even go on to say that, I wish you were all like me. Paul being single at this point. He says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Now, Paul's going to go on to explain here that, that there is a fire that burns within men and within women. And, and this fire is not a bad thing. It's a God-given fire. But there's just a correct context for it. The problem with the fire that we have now is that it's a fallen fire. The problem with this passion that we have now is it's subject to the fall and it's subject to corruption from the world. And so as the Corinthians are getting saved out of this immorality, as they're getting saved out of this uh, pagan mindset and they're seeing the holiness of God and the holiness of the church, they begin to think, well, maybe we should just do away with this altogether. Paul says, look, if that's your heart, it's good for a man, especially an unmarried man, not to touch a woman. That's a good thing. Nevertheless, because of immorality, every man should have his own wife and every wife have her own husband. This is the correct context for that passion that we have, for the passion that the Lord has given us. The correct context is marriage. It's that simple. You, you might sit there and say, well, you mean to tell me that I'm supposed to just mortify this desire until I have a wife or a husband? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you don't like that, take it up with the Lord. I got nothing to do with this. I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. Okay? If you don't like that, pray. Ask the Lord to give you understanding. I, I, I love that as the prophets would cry out to the Lord and as they would reason with him what is it that Habakkuk says he says all right I'll wait here until I'm corrected Lord I have these I have these issues I have this misunderstanding I don't understand but I'm going to wait here until I hear from you and I'm corrected we recognize when we have a problem with what the Lord is saying we're wrong he's right let God be true and every man a liar even if that means me and so even if this is difficult for us to wrap our minds around, even if this is difficult for us to understand, it is true nonetheless. And if it's confronting you and your ideology right now, then my, my advice to you would be to let that ideology die. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife. And let each woman have her own husband. And let the husband render to his wife the affection due her. And likewise also the wife to her husband. Now I probably don't need to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. That there are, as men and as women, we are due different kinds of affection. We express love and we feel love in different kinds of ways. And what Paul is getting at here is he's saying, when you come together as husband and wife, your job as a husband is to render, to give, to sacrificially give back to your wife the affection that she's due. It, look at what it doesn't say. It doesn't say to render to your wife the affection that she wants. It doesn't say that. It's more than that. It's that you owe her. You owe her this affection that she's due this affection. In the same way, wives, render the affection that is due your husband. What is it that makes your husband feel loved? What is it that makes your wife feel loved? Whatever that is, your job is to sacrificially give to them in that way. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Verse 5. I'm just kidding. We'll read the rest of verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Listen, 
Paul is developing an apologetic here that we see all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. This is something that the Lord has been developing throughout the ages. That in Genesis chapter 2 it says that husbands shall leave their father and their mother and do what? Cleave, cling to their bride. That the two shall become one flesh. Literally, the two are going to become one. Do you remember in the garden, in the creation of Eve? We talked about this a little bit last week. When God creates Adam, he creates him from the dust of the earth, right? He just gathers up a bunch of dirty old sand and creates Adam. And that's more evident in some of us men than others, that we were created from the dust of the earth. But then how does he create Eve? He does something special with Eve, right? He fashions her. He doesn't just make Eve like he does Adam. He makes Adam. But there's something special about woman. There's something special about woman over all of the other creation of all time. Something special specifically about women. He takes something from Adam and fashions Eve. And then he brings her and presents her to Adam. And Adam recognizes right then when he sees Eve that he is something different than he's ever been before. He is no longer just Adam. He's no longer just man, but he is now Ish. He is now a husband. He has been transformed. There's a responsibility to his wife now. And he says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She is mine. She is part of me. And God presiding over the first marriage there, ordaining this first marriage union, this covenant that he makes together with Adam and Eve, in that covenant, the two become one. No longer is Eve just alone. No longer is Adam just in charge of his own body, doing whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it. Now he's responsible to his wife, and his wife is responsible to her husband. Paul is saying, look, when you enter into this union, When you enter into this covenant, you don't belong to you anymore. Your body is not your own anymore. It belongs to your spouse. And their body belongs to you. Now, if we look at this in the right way, if we manage ourselves like Christians, called out of darkness into light, and we walk in the light as he is in the light, this is a beautiful beautiful thing. If we're not, however, submitted to the will of the Lord, this can be a dangerous thing. And husbands can use this as a weapon against their wives, and wives can use this as a weapon against their husbands, and there can be all kinds of butting of heads over this, all kinds of disunity that happens as a result of these words, and people have used these words to rule or to lord over their wives or lord over their husbands. It's not the intent of this. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. How did he do that? He gave himself for her. He laid his life down for her. Listen to this. He entered into her world and died there. That's what he did. He entered into her world and he died there. And when did he do that? When she was doing everything right. When she was serving him correctly. When she was loving him correctly, right? No. She hated him. She hated him. She abandoned him. She left him alone to die. And yet he gave himself for her in that time. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were at war, while we were at enmity, at odds with God, he gave himself for us. That's how a husband should love his wife. He should enter into her world and die there. That's all I have to say. That's it. I don't even have anything to say to the wives. Because here's the thing. Husbands, if you lead correctly, if you lead in that way, your wives will follow you. Wives, submit to your husbands, right? As to the Lord, that's really easy to do if your husband is loving you the way Christ loved the church. Ultimately, the onus of the responsibility of the marriage falls on our shoulders. That's why the Lord gave men wider shoulders. We're to hold the weight of it. We bear the weight of the responsibility of our marriage. That doesn't mean that perfect leadership results in perfect outcome. I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm getting at. 
But ultimately, our job is to lead as Christ would lead. And if our wife isn't following us, that doesn't relieve us of our our responsibility to love like Christ loved. Our responsibility is to look like Jesus. And if we're doing that correctly, if we are loving our wives as Christ loved the church, and if our wives are submitting to their own husbands as to the Lord, if that is actually happening, then we're both serving one another, even though my body doesn't belong to me, but it belongs to my wife, and her body belongs to me. If we're both serving each other, then nobody is lacking. Everything, everyone's needs are being fulfilled. That's what Paul is developing here. He's saying, look, you are not your own anymore. You can't live your life just for yourself. You're not the same thing that you were before you were married. You're no longer just a man. You're a husband. And you're no longer just a woman. You are a wife. And the Lord has specific roles for us to fulfill in that marriage bond. Listen, marriage is held in such high esteem with the Lord that it is the only covenant. It is the only covenant that you get to initiate with God. That's amazing, guys. It is the only covenant that you, as a fallen creature, get to initiate with a holy, holy, holy God. And, it's, and he honors it. Not only does he honor it, he's pleased with it. He loves it. It's an earthly representation. It's a living, breathing illustration of Christ and his church. And when you really approach marriage that way, and you really think about it like that, That it's a living, breathing picture of Jesus and his church, husbands. And you start to think about that. You start to consider what that means. That means to the world, you are a picture of Jesus and his love for the church. That should shake you up. If it doesn't, then you're not considering it rightly. You are a picture of the holy God, the Alpha and the Omega, the Creator... All things were made, all things that were made were made by him, through him, for him, and in him all things consist. And you are an earthly representation of him in your marriage. That's wild. And wives, you are a picture of the church and her submission and love to Jesus. That's a huge responsibility. It's a beautiful, beautiful privilege. We have to consider it rightly. We have to, it has to hold as much weight to us as it does to the Lord. You know, our country has what's called no-fault divorce, where you can literally divorce your partner for any reason. And as a result of that, even within the church, the divorce rate is almost 50%. Do you know what it is in the world? 50%. That's a shame. Our job is to hold up marriage as a beautiful union, a wonderful one flesh privilege that we have. That's our job. As ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, our job is not only to preach the gospel in word, but also indeed in the way that we live as married couples. And if you aren't married and you have a desire to be married, what is your job? To be praying for your future wife, your future husband, that the Lord would keep them pure, that the Lord would develop in them this ideology of marriage, that they would hold it right, that they would hold it up so that we could glorify the Lord in it. We can't live for ourselves anymore. You know what makes that easier? The fact that we can't live for ourselves anyway. We don't belong to us. We live for the Lord. We are his purchased possession. Verse 5. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Listen to what Paul is saying. Now listen, we're all mature adults. And if you're not a mature adult and you're sitting in here, then you should act like a mature adult. What Paul is talking about is sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. He's saying that this is a beautiful thing Your body isn't yours anymore. Your body now belongs to your spouse. And our job as husband and wife is to not deprive each other from what the Lord has gifted us in marriage. Again, 
I don't want you to get this twisted, and I don't want you to think of it as a weapon that now, husbands, you get to use against your wife. Well, the Lord said not to deprive me, so remember, though, render to her the affection due her. We feel loved in different ways. We express our love in different ways, and we need to be considerate of each other. That's, that's the heart of Paul. That's what he's getting at. He's saying, look, don't deprive each other. Why? Why not? Because it gives the enemy a foothold in your marriage. Do not deprive one another except, I love that because the word here for deprive is uh, to steal. It's defraud. It's the same word uh, that it uses back in chapter uh, 6 where it says in verse 8, No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. That word cheat there is the same word that it uses here for deprive. It says, do not cheat one another. Do not steal or rob from one another, except with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. The only time that we should be denying each other, denying each other's needs, is when we have to uh, lean into the Lord for a time of fasting and prayer. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's getting at. With consent from each other, where you come together and you decide, hey, we're going to seek the Lord together. Let's give this time for fasting and prayer. But at the end of that, what does he say? And come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I love that. Paul is, he's sure of who they are. He recognizes their humanity. He recognizes their weaknesses. And he's saying, look, when we deprive each other in this area of our marriage, when we deprive these needs that we have for each other, what it does is it gives the enemy a foothold. And because of your lack of self-control, it can lead to immorality. It can lead to division. So he's saying, look, don't deprive each other except with consent for a time. And it, the only reason for that is to give yourselves to seek the Lord in fasting and prayer. And when you've done that, Come together again so that the enemy does not tempt you. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish <clears throat> that all men were even as, my, as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God. One in, his, one in this manner and another in that. So he's saying, look, I'm about to give you a concession. This is, this is from me. This is not from the Lord. This is Pastor Paul speaking from his own... Uh, Wisdom, what he's about to say in verse 7. He's saying this is not a commandment from the Lord. This is my own practical wisdom. This is my own practical feeling. This is the way I feel. Okay, he says, I wish that all men were even as myself. What is he talking about? Being single. Paul is single at this point. Now, I, I, I do believe that Paul had a wife at some point. I don't know why he doesn't now. But I believe that we can draw inference from the word of God that Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin as he casts his vote against Stephen. And in the Talmud, it says that to be a part of the Sanhedrin, you have to be married. And so it would be logical for us to conclude that Paul, at some point, had a wife. Now, why does he not have a wife now? I don't know. It doesn't tell us in Scripture. Maybe she died. Maybe she left him. We're not really sure. Paul leaves uh, Jerusalem to go to Damascus. He's going to Damascus with a letter uh, to bring all of those who are believers in Jesus bound to Jerusalem. And then he doesn't come back again for 13 years. Maybe she uh, left him. He leaves to go out for milk, doesn't come back for 13 years. And then when he does come back, he's a Christian. He's, he's a Jesus lover, right? And you can imagine as a first century Jewish wife, your husband who is a rabbi, a Pharisee of Pharisees, leaves and then 13 years later comes back and says, sorry honey, I got delayed, but also I love Jesus now. You can imagine that would be grounds for divorce in her mind. Or maybe she died. Maybe that's why we see so much rage in the Apostle Paul uh, before he comes to Christ, that he wants to destroy the church. Who knows? But what Paul is saying here is that right now he's single and he's saying... And I wish that all men were even as, my, as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Why is Paul saying that he wishes that all men could be like him? Why, why is Paul saying that he wishes that all men could be single? Now, there's all kinds of differing opinions on this. There's all kinds of differing thoughts on this. 
But we know from the word of God that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. That a prudent wife is a blessing to men. I couldn't even begin to imagine where I would be if I didn't have Chela in my life. If I didn't have a godly wife. I probably wouldn't be here. I probably wouldn't be teaching God's word. I, I can't imagine where I would be. And so I know that the Lord's desire for me was to have a godly wife because he gave her to me. But Paul could say, here, I wish that all men were even as I, myself, single. Well, Paul recognizes, I think, this is my opinion. You're entitled to your own opinion. I often say your own distorted opinion, but Corey gives me a hard time about saying that. But in my humble but correct opinion, I think that the Apostle Paul is saying that because he's seeing the persecution that he's suffering as a result of following Jesus. Think about what Paul has been through. Everywhere he goes, he's beaten and imprisoned and enchained and stoned and left for dead. Now imagine how difficult that would be if you have your wife with you in tow who is also being beaten and stoned and imprisoned. Paul also sees the cultural climate of the world that he lives in and sees Caesar Nero seated on the throne now for three years. And in ten years from this point, Rome is going to burn and Christians are going to be burned at the stake, uh, crucified, killed left and right. And Paul is looking at the cultural climate that he's in and saying, it's easier without a wife. He's not saying it's better. But Paul recognizes that when you are married, there's certain responsibilities that you have. When you have your spouse, that's your first ministry. And Paul recognizes the freedom to go wherever and to die whenever for the Lord because he's single. I think that's why he's laying that out for us. I don't think, I, I think it's flippant and irresponsible to say that Paul is saying that Jesus is coming back soon so it's not worth getting a wife. I don't think that's what he's saying at all. I think he just recognizes the practical reality of it, that when you have a wife and children, it's much easier for you to be beaten and imprisoned and killed than to watch your wife and children be beaten or burned at the stake in front of you. When you think about the Apostle Paul and what he did before he was a Christian, it says that he compelled Christians to blasphemy at the edge of a sword. What does that look like? In a time where Christians were routinely being put to death for their faith, what would it take for you to blaspheme the Lord who pulled you out of darkness? What would it take? Would it take someone killing your children in front of you? Paul recognizes the weak points of man. Paul recognizes the breaking points of man. And he's saying, look, I could wish that all men were, were like me, were single. So they could be totally given over to ministry. Totally given over without any uh, hindrance, without any worry. If the Lord called them away to a foreign country, they don't have to worry about packing their kids up and taking them with, with them or being away from them for any specific amount of time. But, he says, but each one has his own gift from God. If you have a wife, it's a gift from God. If you have no desire for a wife, that's a gift from God. If you have no desire to be married, praise the Lord, stay there. You don't, ha you don't need to feel compelled to have a spouse. You don't need to feel compelled to have a husband or a wife. You're not missing something if you don't. If the Lord has designed you in such a way to as not desire a wife, that's fine. But if the Lord has given you a desire for a wife, a burning passion for a wife or a husband, that is also a gift. I think sometimes, well, we know that there are certain movements that think of celibacy or think of singleness as some high spiritual uh, proof of your life. And we see all the problems that come along with forced celibacy. That's not what the Lord is getting at. He's saying, if you want to be a eunuch for the kingdom, that has to be a gift that I've given you. I don't have that gift. And I don't want it. I'm happy with the gifting that the Lord has given me. The Lord saw fit to give me a wife. The Lord saw fit to give me children. And I think through those things, I'm better equipped to be a pastor to you. Each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. If you don't have a desire to be married, if you don't have a passion to be married, then it's good to remain single. You can be totally given over to the Lord in this. I, I was sharing with the guys this morning, um, uh, there is a pastor in Merritt Island 
named uh, Pastor Howard, and he's an older gentleman. Him and his wife had been married for over 60 years, for a very, very long time, and she passed away. And I was having a discussion with him about how he was dealing with that, what was going on with him and his wife, and he said, you know, uh, I said, man, I'm so sorry to hear about your wife. He said, don't be sorry. She's in glory. She's together with the Lord. We had a beautiful time of marriage. It was awesome. The Lord gave us however many beautiful years. But the Lord has closed that book of my wife and I being together. He's written this wonderful book, and that's closed. And now he started a new book where I get to wake up every morning and ask him, Lord, how do I get to just serve you today? That's awesome. What a great perspective. And so if you don't have that desire for marriage, if you're single or widowed, then remain single. It's good. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. It's better to marry than to burn with passion. If you're in a place where you are burning with passion, if you're in a place where you're unmarried, but you have a a significant other, you have a a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or you're courting someone, or you're just in the place where you're looking for a bride or a husband, and you have this God-given desire in you, then it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Anytime we sit down for premarital counseling, when I'm talking to a couple who is uh, engaged I always tell them not to have a long engagement. There's no need for it. If you have, I, I, I heard a pastor say once, if you have a long engagement, it's like going shopping with no money. Either you leave with, you take something that doesn't belong to you or you just leave frustrated. Listen, if you're in a relationship and you feel like this is the person that the Lord has given you, marry them. The world will tell you to wait, but that's stupid. What would you wait for? Just marry them. If you're waiting till you're in a better position financially, marry them. If you're waiting till you graduate school, marry them. If you're of legal age, I'm not talking about if you're in middle school or <laughs> You know what I'm getting at. Don't look for loopholes. Listen, I wish I was born married. This is the best thing that ever happened to me, being married. Marriage is the most beautiful gift that the Lord could ever give you, but I do want to say, that doesn't mean, especially to the men, that just find someone who's breathing and marry them. That's not what I'm getting at either. I'm saying it has to be who the Lord has brought you, okay? Your job, if you're unmarried, your job, if you're seeking a husband or a wife, is to be praying that the Lord would do it in his perfect timing. I really believe that the Lord has created someone to fulfill all of those desires that he's given you. If he's given you the desire, then there's someone to fulfill those desires. But it's the one he wants in his timing. Better to marry than to burn with passion. Verse 10. Now, to the married, I command. Listen to this. Remember, this was Paul's opinion, which, by the way, holds much weight. This is the Apostle Paul set apart by the Spirit of God to teach the church. So when he gives you his opinion, you should listen. It's a godly opinion, full of wisdom. But he's saying this isn't a commandment from the Lord. But here, in verse 10, this is a commandment. Look at what he says. Now to the married, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So who does this command come from? The Lord. This is directly from God. Paul is saying, this is a command to you who are married. What is the command? A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Here he is speaking to married believers in Jesus. Christians who have entered into a covenant together with God. He is saying... Do not be divorced. Do you realize that the Lord hates divorce? He hates it. He hates it. Jesus said, really, the only biblical reason for divorce is adultery. And even then, how does he qualify that? He says, it's because of the hardness of your heart. Because the Lord's heart is always, always reconciliation. Think about what he lays out for us in Hosea. What does Gomer do in Hosea? She goes to a life of prostitution. She's married, and she goes into a life of prostitution, and she separates from her husband, and then what does, the, what does God tell Hosea to do? 
go back and get her and love her. Love her. He doesn't say feel an overwhelming emotional feeling for her. He says practically go get her and love her. And that is a picture of what he's going to do for Israel. Israel committing spiritual adultery against the Most High God. Walked out of a relationship together with him and committed adultery against him with foreign gods. But he says he is going to get her. He's going to woo her. He's going to bring her back into a relationship with him. And guess what he's going to do then? Love her. He's going to love her and forgive her. The only real biblical reason for divorce is adultery. But even that is because of the hardness of our hearts. Let him not divorce her. Listen, if we could just get it through our mind, if we could really think properly about what marriage is, it makes this much easier. It makes these things that we're reading go down a lot smoother if we could just really, really consider what we're doing in marriage and what our job is in the earth. Our job is to endure hardship in the earth, right? We're, we're, going to, we're going to face tribulation, trial, hardship in the earth. And the way that we approach those trials and tribulations that we get from the world should compel unbelievers to ask us, what is the reason for the hope that is within you, right? As we're suffering, as we're going through persecution, we should be able to do that in such a way with joy that the people who don't know Jesus would look at us and say, how can you go through this and have such hope? How can you go through what you're going through and have such joy? And then we get to tell them about the gospel. We get to tell them about our God who stepped down from the throne of heaven and died so that we could live, washed us in his blood and redeemed us and forgave us of our sins. We have to apply that same apologetic, that same reasoning to marriage. The point of marriage is to reflect Jesus to the world so that when there's hardship and tribulation and persecution in our marriage, when somebody is, when, when our wife is against us, set against us, and it feels so difficult, we should love her in such a way as the rest of the world would look at that and say, how can you love her? How can you have such hope for your marriage when you're going through such a difficult time? And you get to say, well, Jesus redeemed me, and I'm his bride, and he loves me this way, and now I can love her like that. It's a testimony to the world. That's how we should approach our marriages. Does that mean it's easy? No. Probably not for you. Easy for me. I have a wonderful, perfect bride. So I don't really, I, I'm just saying these things so that I can identify with you. I don't really practically know any of them. But marriage is not easy, man. It takes work. It takes maintenance. It takes you dying to yourself daily. It takes you putting yourself on the back burner daily and living for your spouse daily. But it's the best investment you'll ever make. Verse 13, And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. I love this. Paul is dealing with all of the practical questions that come up for the Christian life, right? How are we to conduct ourselves with purity? How are we to live in a married relationship? How are we to live and function within this covenant of marriage as believers? Well, as believers, our job is to reflect Christ and the church to the world. But what if I'm an unbeliever? And my wife is an unbeliever. And we get saved, and then I get saved. I'm sorry, and then we get married, but then I get saved, but my wife doesn't. Then what? I mean, Paul in other places says not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. That if you're going to marry only in the Lord, it's only in the Lord. So for a believer in Jesus, it is forbidden. Listen to this. It's forbidden not to marry an unbeliever. It's just that... That's the way it is. Why? Because what fellowship has light with darkness? But what happens when you're both unbelievers and one of you gets saved? Then should I leave them? Because you say not to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. What should I do? Well, look at what Paul says. If a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, 
let her not divorce him. The same goes for a husband who has an unbelieving wife. If she's willing to dwell with you, literally it means to tabernacle with you, to be with you in your faith and your faith, then remain married. That's your job. Whether or not you knew it when you started, you're in a covenant. Covenants are not so easily dismissed. And so your job is to remain married, even if you're married to an unbeliever. Now, that's a difficult thing. When Chayla and I got married, neither one of us were walking with the Lord. We weren't. We, we would have both told you that we were believers, but we weren't walking with the Lord. It had no bearing, no effect on my life. It, didn't, it wasn't a transformative belief. It wasn't a transformative faith in Jesus. The Holy Spirit hadn't yet awoken my heart to the reality of obedience and, and living for Him and submission to Him. And so we would have both said that we believed in Jesus, but it didn't change our lives. And, and then both of us, really my wife first, she took me to church. She, the Lord put it on her heart that we should be in church. We should get our kids in church, and we went. And the Lord did this miraculous work in both of us and brought us along in this walk of faith together with him and transformed our lives. But I can't imagine what it would be like for her if I would have refused to go. And I can't imagine what it would be like for me in the calling that the Lord has given me for my wife to not be with me in it. I can't imagine the difficulty that there are those of us in this room who face this. But look what he says. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Now, that doesn't mean saved. That's not what it's saying. It doesn't mean that the unbelieving uh, husband is saved by the faith of his wife. You can't inherit salvation uh, through someone else. You can't be saved by proxy. But set apart, there's a, there is a holiness that comes into the house through the life of a believer, through Christian living. There's sanctification and holiness that comes into the house, an umbrella of protection from the Lord that comes into the house through the believer. And so he's saying, look, if you have an unbelieving husband, don't divorce your husband because he's set apart from the world by you and your chaste living, your chaste conduct, your, your, your internal beauty that comes through a faith in Jesus. When you have that, your husband is set apart by that. And also, your children who were once unclean, living in a pagan lifestyle, uh, living under this pagan ideology, are being set apart through the faith of one of the... Uh, parents, if you're a believing wife and have an unbelieving husband, your children see the effect of Christ in you. And it does something to sanctify them. It does something to bring them out of this ideology and place them in the light. You hear it all the time pastors say, more, more is caught than taught. Pastor Chuck Smith used to say that. More is caught than taught. You can, you can tell your child something until you're blue in the face, but they learn most of what they know from you from watching you. Not necessarily from the words that you say, but from the way you live, which is a scary thought for me. He's saying that the unbelieving husband is sanctified, set apart from the world by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is set apart by the husband. And otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. It doesn't mean they're saved. It means they're set apart. But if the unbeliever departs, listen to this, so here you are, married, you get saved, you're now a believer, you have an unbelieving spouse, and they're not with it. They don't like it. They don't like who you've become. They don't like uh, being the, the light exposing their darkness. If the unbeliever departs, what should you do? Let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Paul is saying if you're married to an unbeliever and they decide to leave you, you don't have to chase them down. You don't have to beg them to stay. You're not called to bondage, but to peace. If they can't dwell with you in your faith and they decide to leave, you've been loosed from them in that. If the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O oh wife? This is why you stay. This is why you stay. How do you know, O oh wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O oh husband, whether you will save your wife? Think about that. That's our job, isn't it? To evangelize, to share the gospel, to be a light to the world, the salt of the earth, to be shining like a city on a hill. 
to see souls saved. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation. You have been given the ministry of the gospel of peace. You get to go out into the world and preach this saving gospel to an unbelieving world, a world that is lost in darkness, a world that is heading towards eternal damnation. You get to go out and to preach the light to those in darkness. How much more so do you get to do that at home? I think sometimes we separate the two. We think about our home life as like our time to rest, our time to just prop our feet up and not to have to think about these things. But how much more so should we be preaching the gospel at home? How do you know if you're married to an unbeliever whether or not they will get saved by the transforming power of, of God's grace in your life? seeing what the Lord has done in you. Do you know that the people that you live with know you better than anybody else in the whole entire world? If you really want to know who a man is, don't ask him. Ask his children. Ask his wife. And if they're honest with you, they'll tell you who the man really is. They'll tell you who he was before he believed in Jesus, and they'll tell you who he was after there is a transformation that happens to you by the power of God's grace in your life that your family cannot deny. They'll see it. They'll see those glimmers of the old man in you, but they'll see the transformation of your life. And as a result, they could step into that light with you. You could have a, 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 a real hand in leading your unbelieving spouse into salvation. That's why you stay. Even if it means a a life of suffering, even if it means a life of hardship, you stay because you don't know what the Lord could do. You pray because you don't know what the Lord will do. You just have faith because you don't know how much the Lord loves your partner. He loves them as much as he loves you, and he loved you enough to pull you out, to pull you out of that darkness, and he can do the same in them. So we stay and we believe that the Lord will do a work. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. I'm going to have the worship team come up. Listen, I know not all of this applies to every single one of us, but some of it applies to all of us. And so what we do is we take the Word of God and we apply it to our hearts. We let the Lord wash over us. We let the Lord transform us by His Word. And we let the Lord renew our mind. We see this transformation that we look more like Jesus, and it's by the renewing of our mind. And so let the, let the Word of God sink in. It's not just... Uh, tips for easy living. This is the true word of God that is written in heaven, never to fade, never to fail, never to pass away. Let it take root in your heart and transform you into his image and likeness. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for your truth. Lord, we thank you that you love us enough to confront us in our misunderstandings, in our false ideology. Lord, we, we thank you that you love us enough to make us uncomfortable. Father, I pray that you would just do a tremendous work in our hearts by your spirit. Lord, that you would remind us of who we are and our job to look like you. Help us with that, Holy Spirit. We know that you're able. We know that you will fully sanctify us because you, he who called us is faithful and will do it. So we can bet on that. We can count on it, Lord. Remind us of the hope that we have in you, that living, abiding hope. And help us to run this race well with endurance. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord.
awesome to watch you guys worship the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. Listen, I want to remind you that Pastor Jim Gallagher will be here Wednesday evening. If you're not normally coming out on a Wednesday night, clear your schedule, make a way to be here. You'll be blessed for it. I would like him to get to know you guys, to see uh, what the Lord is doing in you and through you in the community. So uh, try to be here Wednesday night. You'll be blessed anyway. It's not just for me, it's for you too. So Come out and share fellowship time with us. We've been going through the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights anyway, so you guys should all be here. So I'll be looking out for you this Wednesday. Let's pray. Let me pray a blessing over you. Lord, would you bless your church this week? Uh, Lord, as they go out of this place, would you fill them with your spirit, Lord? Just a fresh filling, Lord, a fresh anointing as they go out into the darkness, Lord, that they would just shine your light so bright. Lord, as they're going out into the mission field of the world that we live in, uh, that they would just have your testimony fast on their lips. Lord, the gospel ready to preach. Would you do a work through them this week, Lord? Remind them of who they are in you. Remind them that they're not alone, that you're with them. Uh, remind them of the privilege that it is to be called your children, your sons and your daughters. Uh, that we are not 
This is not our home, that we're pilgrims, that we're sojourners here, that we are ambassadors for Christ. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would do a tremendous work through your church. Lord, we want to see a great spiritual awakening uh, in this city, in these in this county, Lord, in this world, we want to see uh, people coming to Christ. Would you use us as warriors for your kingdom? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I love you guys. I'll see you Wednesday.